We're here with uh, Jay Vincent in Clifton Park at your facility, BioFit. Um, you're renowned as a fitness model. Tell me what it was that got you, um, well, A, into being a fitness model to start off with. Well, no, I always trained um, for football, for sports. And uh, I continued to train after I stopped playing college football. And I enjoyed training. So I wanted to put it to some sort of use, and everyone always told me that I had a relatively good physique and that it could be potentially good for, for fitness modeling. So what I did was I applied to a very popular agency down in New York City called Silver uh, Model Management, and um, I had the, the raw potential to become a fitness model, whether it be uh, you know, a remarkable physique, relatively muscular, not over muscular. I'm not sure exactly what they look for, but the agency saw something in me. There was only one stipulation, I just needed to add more muscle. I wasn't big enough. Um, so what happened was I started doing the research on, on exercise science and nutrition on how to add that extra muscle tissue. Because at this point, I had already been training for, I would say about seven years, and I feel that I reached my genetic ceiling. Um, and that's kind of when I started to do the research and I stumbled across high intensity training. What have you been doing up to that point? So just give us a little bit of background about the training you've been doing from football then into post-college. What, how were you training yourself? I was doing, you know, a traditional bodybuilding split. Um, in football, we don't really learn too much about training. We kind of pick it up on our own. The basic exercises, the bench press, the squat, etc. So where I got a lot of my training information from was just traditional bodybuilding splits or bodybuilding.com or whichever gym rat was in the gym. I kind of watched what they did. Right. Um, so traditionally I did, you know, the, the uh, back by chest try leg split. Gotcha. Oftentimes um, chest twice a week with triceps and shoulders. Um, It'd be more a posterior anterior split and um, then the back and buys twice a week multiple sets multiple exercises you know for instance a chest routine would in incorporate four exercises three sets a piece each 10 to 12 repetitions very very high volume so what were you, was your rep control like what, what kind of speed of movement were you using back then no concern for speed of right movement. just heavy weight move it for the prescribed repetition range Put it down. So it'd be 8 to 12 reps, 8 to as 10 reps. As soon as I hit 12, it was over with. Oh. But I do remem remember distinctively when I was very young and I began training, I remember my uncle always used to tell me, he was one of my football coaches when I was very young, trained to failure. I didn't really know what it meant, but he told me at a very young age, I'm not sure where he learned this, yeah. but trained to failure. So believe it or not, I was carrying almost every set to failure, multiple sets, multiple exercises. Wow. So from a young age, I was always training to muscular failure. Yeah, yeah. So, so that being the case, um, how are you coping physically with that? Because training to failure can be quite demanding. Mm -hmm. um, so you were in the gym, you know, let's say what was about five days a week, right? Right. Training to failure five days a week, albeit on a three-way split. Right. Um, was that taking its toll on you or, or just at that age you were able to manage it, you were able to get away with yeah. it? I think that had a lot to do with at the age. Um, it, it, at about you know 20 to 22 years old, those that sort of physical stress doesn't take as much of a toll on you as maybe now in my mid to late 20s. So I think that had something to do with it. Also, my definition of muscular failure back then is far different than what it is now. Ah, explain that a little to me. So what, what was failure to you then? Failure to me then was the, uh, the last repetition was very difficult. Right. That's what muscular failure was to me now. Today, it's literally reaching positive concentric failure and continuing to inroad and push past that, which is much more intense than what I was doing in the past. So you, you'd followed this um, typical pattern of training that, that mm -hmm. most 20-something guys, teens 20-something guys go through, following us on bodybuilding.com, and then you went to this agent in New York and they said you need a bit more muscle mass, and you decided to start looking around. How was it that you got exposed to high-intensity training? Well, I was working a uh, typical office job in a cubicle, and there wasn't much to do since I really wasn't interested in the work, so I didn't do much of the work. I spent the whole day researching exercise science. I was just scrolling through YouTube and came across Doug McGuff's 21 convention video. Right. And I watched it from start to finish, and it changed my life on how I viewed exercise. So you, you, you watched this um, Dr. McGuff, Doug McGuff speaking, and what, was happen what happened to you? You was like, Pshh. Light bulb. Right. I, I just I, what he was saying made so much sense, and my my thoughts in my own head were, oh my god, I've been doing this wrong for so long. So that was my initial exposure to high intensity training principles. Following that, I saw um, interviews and 
and seminars by Drew Bay, who embellished a little further, which led me to Drew Bay's uh, website and his forums, um, led me to buy Body by Science, and then it was just a slippery slope from there of gathering all the information, finding new people, and reading and studying at a, in depth this protocol and the science behind it, and learning as much as I possibly could. And then I started to apply the principles to my own training, reduction in volume, reduction in frequency, increase in intensity, and then I was able to put on the necessary muscle tissue in order to get into a successful well, fitness Well, wait, hold on, career. Jay, you're saying that you reduced your volume, you reduced your frequency, applied the hip principles, and you gained more muscle tissue than you had been doing through volume. That's right. So what the case was is I was extremely overtrained. I'd wake up every morning feeling like I was hit by a bus, and I was sleeping 10, 9, 10 hours a night, perfect, spot on nutrition, not seeing progress, very exhausted. As soon as I made the switch to a reduction in volume and a reduction in frequency, my body started to respond, recover, and grow. But at the same time, the workouts were much more intense. Mm. Um, so there wasn't any an antagonism for you when you when you you didn't feel like ah, I've been in my in the gym killing myself five days. This can't be right. This hit stuff can't be right. But was was there any mental sort of antagonism, or you just were like, no, this this makes sense straight away. Straight away, it made sense. But again, when you've stuck to a particular style of training or you've made a habit out of anything in life, it's very hard to break. Mm. So I slowly started incorporating them. Rather than do training each body part twice a week, I backed it off to one. I wasn't doing one set to failure in the beginning, I was doing two. Because mm. again, your definition of failure in the beginning may be a little weak, but as time right. goes on, you learn how to fatigue your muscles a little more deep over a little deeper over time. Yeah. So that two sets turned into one because the two sets became intolerable over, after a period of time. And then it, it's, as time went on, I kept gradually tapering down volume and frequency to the point where now I'm only doing a, a handful of exercises a couple times a week with a very, very high intensity of effort. So how long did that process, so that exposure to uh, Doug's lecture on YouTube, to starting to apply those principles in a, in sort of a, um, a sort of a, an approach which worked for you to start off with wasn't maybe classical hit start with was a mm -hmm. reduction it was a transition phase from that volume to a more high intensity training approach. Mm -hmm. How long until you you ended up sort of with a sort of classical hit approach of once or twice a week or, or twice a week 20 30 minute workouts? It was probably over the course of about a year. Right. Where it, it took me enough time to taper it down and really get the old mentality of more is better out of my head and um, but again you know just by nature training in that fashion training with that level of intensity the volume and frequency had to be reduced because you would feel it and I felt just over time as I reduced the volume and the frequency I felt better and I, I responded better so it was it was uh, more so I just wanted to do what I knew my body was responding to and um, it just, by nature, kind of tapered itself down into the traditional high intensity training approach. Granted, in the beginning, you know, I, I was exposed to super slow. Um, I thought super slow was, wasn't really for me, but for a period of time I was doing super slow. And then I really realized it wasn't for me. So basically over time, um, I'm not really too particular on the cadence, mm -hmm. but it is, it is using an adequate resistance, moving slowly, slow changes in direction. Those are the things over time it took some time to really incorporate very strictly into the training. And for you, uh, an appropriate cadence seems to be round about five seconds. Round about five, five seconds, seconds seems to be perfectly yeah. Um wh What it sounds like to me is you had this like sort of epiphany moment and then you gradually changed your training. And as you were doing that, you had the intellectual ability and, and, and awareness and intuition, perhaps to a degree as well, to keep mutating that training mm -hmm. as it was appropriate for you. How would somebody do that? Is there some, was there something behind your thinking? Was there something that allowed you to, were you just listening to your body? What was it for you that allowed you to go on this process, do you think? I think it was a lot of really listening to the body because me in particular I learned over time that I can inroad very very deeply right my, my ability to fatigue my muscles is is far beyond anyone I've ever met so the you know tapering it down like this it was also almost a necessity because I simply could not continue to go and train could, yeah. I just couldn't physically tolerate it so less of a calculated measured approach my personal experience I kind of went off of how I felt because 
I, I assumed at the time that feeling tremendously run down, feeling tired, and not having the ability to create that intensity in the gym meant that I probably wasn't stimulating what I wanted to stimulate and I wasn't going to get the results I needed. So it was more listening listening to my body. At the time, I wasn't tracking my workouts and I wasn't looking for strength improvements or making sure I was progressing. It was more kind of feeling how my body felt. And a lot of the times too, I mean, when you carry a, a decent amount of muscle tissue, you can feel when, it, when it's starting to atrophy and you can feel when you're starting to fill up. And I kind of listened to that as well. Aha. Uh -huh. So there was that awareness of how it was affecting your size oh, yeah. and you could be in tune with that. Yeah, it was weird. It, you know, sometimes I would just notice when I took more days off, you know, with the, say a, a training session on a Monday, a Tuesday, and then by the time Wednesday hit, I felt like I had grown slightly. Uh -huh. And then I, and I told myself, well, I'm going to keep this up, take Thursday off. I felt even better. And then I felt so recovered that now I was anxious to get back in the gym. So I noticed if I train more frequently, I, for one reason or another, felt that I began to lose size. So that's when I really started to taper it back because I just, you, you could feel by the way you put on your clothes. So you would lose size if you trained too much? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And for you, is there a period of time where you noticed that it's too long between workouts and that you start to feel you are getting smaller? if you don't input another workout. Yeah, I don't, I don't think people should take um, a week in between in between workouts. I believe that if you're training relative, relatively consistently, it's not that you're actually losing muscle tissue. It might have to do with some sort of blood flow to the tissue or, or sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, but not actual myofibular hypertrophy that you're losing within the course of a week. And it could also be psychological. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe, you know, a couple times a week is fine. If you're waiting a week in between workouts, you're really not optimizing everything you can do. And um, in terms of, of muscular growth, I don't, th I don't think that's an appropriate frequency. But again, um, more is not better. There is a definite point of adverse effects and a definite point of overtraining. And I try to really take that into account and really try to avoid that. So if it comes to a point where um, I'm not feeling good enough to train, even if I've given myself adequate rest and that is the training day, I'll take the day off because what you want to do, you want to stimulate, you want to make sure you have the psychological motivation and the energy in order to get everything you can out of each exercise in that workout. Because that's the point, the point is to really pour everything you can into that workout and then allow for the recovery of the next few days. And reminds me, today, where we're at now, um, how often do you train and how long do your sessions last? So a lot of people ask me um, how many times I train per week. Right. Um, I really don't follow a week by week schedule. I just allow enough rest days in between. Um, it seems to be if I allow two full days in between if I'm doing a split, it seems to be adequate. And I've just learned over time. If I allow one day, I'm not able to reach the level of intensity that I'd, I'm after. Um, if I allow three days, I could allow three days, but I think two days seems to be the good balance. So Now, you mentioned a split. Yeah. What does that split look like? I will do an upper body and lower body split. So, right. for instance, if I were to start the upper body workout on a Monday, I would take a Tuesday and a Wednesday off, do the lower body split on the Thursday, take a Friday, Saturday off repeat on Sunday and keep repeating and continuing the process. But again, if one day I'm a little busy with clients, uh, busy with schedules, something's going on, I can, I'll can skip the day. It's not that big of a deal. Um, but to, it's just since there's an uneven number of days in a seven day week, yeah. it doesn't make much sense to try to base it on that. Yeah. Um, give yourself a couple of days and just keep repeating the process. So you, um, you, do you go back to full body routine sometimes, full body workouts? I do go back to full body workouts some, when time is a factor, when it's, I really don't have the time or, or desire. You know, at the, at the end of the day, if I've trained 15 clients that day, um, I'll cram it all into one and just go home. You know, just get it done with, yeah. go home, yeah. go to bed, eat, recover, um, in that case. But a lot of times too, I just kind of like to switch them for the sake of variety too. So yeah. varying between a split routine and a full body routine um, offers a good amount of variety. So it keeps things interesting. So you can stick with it and not get bored. Yeah, and you've got, um, you, you do this full body, you do split. Um, with clients, 
What do you find tends to work best? I find a full body split works best with, best with clients. So you do a full body routine in general. Yeah, because I mean, most clients most clients aren't going to have the time. They're not going to have the time or the desire to go to the gym that frequently or train that frequently. So in terms of overall response, I think the body the body responds as a whole. So if you fatigue the body as a whole, it's going to have uh, more of a systemic fatigue, which is going to stimulate the entire body to respond as a whole. So I think in terms of efficiency. Full body is the way to go. But when you want to start going to a split routine is when you're accumulating such a deep level of fatigue that you cannot tolerate additional exercises. So the point is a reduction in volume. Um, so for instance, if I'm doing a leg training routine, there's nothing left for the upper body. Right. And, and that tells you something. I yeah. mean, you've inroaded and fatigued uh, uh, your nervous system and, and all you've used all your resources that there's nothing left to, to even um, produce an adequate stimulus in the upper body. So in that case, take a rest and then train the upper body the next day when you're fresh. Just makes I, I, sense. I've seen you train now and I've seen mm -hmm. how much of an impact your training has on you and your physiology. And I, having looked at other people as well in the past, I'd say this is an issue more for bigger guys, guys who are carrying more muscle tissue. The, 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 the deeper you're able to um, fatigue that level of muscle tissue, the more likely a split routine, so an upper lower is yeah. going to be important. Would, mm -hmm. would you agree with that yeah i would agree with that too just from overall personal experience um but again you know people like me they're going to be few and far between right and still people like me they could they could you know benefit from a full body routine if they if they so choose to but you know if 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 you've got the time and you've got the resources then in a split routine works for you and just like i said if you're feeling such a deep level of fatigue um in the legs or in the upper body that you can't continue a full body workout then yeah that's a good time to implement it but um Again, for 90% of the people, 95% of the people, you can get the most bang for your buck in just one full body, full body routine. Basic exercises carry to muscle failure. And I just, I just want to recap this. Um, so your training, and I know we don't, we don't particularly want to work it around weeks, but I'd say on average you're probably training two, maybe three times a week. But each body part is getting hit once a week, maybe twice right. a week, right? I'm about right. So. And what kind of time are we talking about altogether? So how, how much of a time investment is that? Each workout, I mean, uh, my leg workout will probably last eight to 12 minutes. Yeah. Um, that's, again, that's a workout that I'll just yeah. get done, go home. Um, for the upper body routine, more like 20, yeah, 20 minutes or so. So, so the time investment we're looking at, you know, I don't know, 30 to 40 minutes a week, really. 30 to 40 minutes a week. Of, okay. Yeah, of, of, of total training. So. What's your secret? I mean, come on, 20 to 30, 40 right. minutes a week. Is, this is the secret, and I, I don't tell many of my clients this, but you need to sleep standing up. That's the secret. You need to sleep standing up? Okay. You've got to do that? That's what I tell a lot of clients, <laughs> because they're, they're looking for a secret. The truth right. is there isn't a secret. The secret is in the, is in the genetic predisposition. And I try to tell a lot of clients this. I mean, when you look at skin color, there's a very broad spectrum. There are albinos on one end, there are African Americans, or Africans on the other end. Tremendous variance. Now these people are all going to respond differently to UV light, just like there is a, a tremendous difference in exercise tolerance and in response to exercise too. So a lot of it is genetics, and in the in the course we go over specific genetics that dictate this difference. But you know, someone who is um, um, from Northern Europe is not going to want to receive the same sun exposure as someone from, say, Puerto Rico. Their tolerance is going to be very different. The same goes for training. Some people with particular genetics are not going to want to follow an, an exercise protocol um, or a volume protocol similar to someone who has a high tolerance for exercise. And this is dictated by either muscle fiber type or other specific uh, uh, genetic variations that people really kind of find out just through training on their own, just through trial and error, really. There really isn't a tremendous amount of testing you need to do to find this out, but over time, you'll figure out what is good volume and frequency for you based on really, really on how you feel and your results, whether it be in uh, body composition or strength improvement. I assume um, at BioFit, you train quite a wide variety of different body types, right. men, women. Um, is there much adaptation that needs to be made to the to the routine, for example, that we've got in um, this course, or, or by and large, are you having people do that? What, what, is there much of that adaptation that you make? No, not really. I mean, I, I will create variation within the exercise protocol, mostly for psychological reasons. The, the fact of the matter is, very basic exercises is, is all you really need. Because 
I think there's a problem with the uh, the fitness industry and the magazines. So they've the the purpose of these magazines is to sell you things, and in particular supplements. Now, what reason would anyone have to purchase this magazine? Really, to learn all these secret exercises or these different protocols you can use to develop the physique of the model on the front of the magazine. So. What they do is they pour in a tremendous amount of really stupid, inefficient, useless exercises. And what it's done is convinced people that they need a tremendous amount of variation to target the short head of the biceps versus the long head of the biceps in order to maximize their muscular development. The truth is they're all connected. They all work together. And a very basic multi-joint movement is going to stimulate them to a very, very high degree to the point where it's almost almost a waste of time to add single joint movements or or not isolation movements but emphasize emphasis movements on the biceps or triceps or things like that so what i will do is i will sprinkle these single joint movements in for variety just to keep people you know mentally fresh because it can get boring me personally i like boring it's fine it's fine with me <laughs> but um do you need uh these these you know the scandinavian split squat or the turkish get up Absolutely not. What you need is a leg press, what you need is a pull down, and you're gonna stimulate and get 90 to 95% of your of your optimal uh, growth potential out of those, those really basic exercises, provided you train intensely, of course.